welcome to tonight's tale, a fairy tale theater podcast. We are going through every episode of Shelley Duvall's fairy tale theater in alphabetical order. I'm your host, Emily from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm joined by my always beautiful co-host, Eric. I'm Eric from New York. This month, we are joined by our friend, Melina. Hi, I'm Melina from Nunavut. And this month, we are reviewing the episode, Jack in the Beanstalk, which has never been a favorite of mine, I'll be quite honest. Before we do our rewatch, Eric, do you have the background information on this episode? Yes, Jack and the Beanstalk was from season two, episode four. It aired on September 8th, 1983. It was directed by Lamont Johnson, and it was written by Mark Curtis and Rod Ash. It was actually filmed October 19th, 1982 to October 23rd, 1982. Quick filming. Yeah, quick turnaround. Yeah. Only a couple days. Before we go into our rewatch, what is the very first thing that springs to mind when you think of this episode, Melina? What I remember the most of watching it as a kid, I think I only saw it once or twice, but Jerry Hall in the harp, that's like one thing that I like distinctly remember. Wow. And then also- (laughs) That's a surprising answer because that's such a very short cameo. I know. I know, but I remember that. And I also remember when he climbs the beanstalk for the first time and sees the dude with the weird nose. (laughs) With the weird nose. Yeah. I know exactly who you mean. And I'll have plenty to say about the dude with the weird nose. Eric, what are your your first thoughts when you think of the episode Jack and the Beanstalk? I love Elliot Gould's giant in this. He's probably like my favorite part of the whole thing. Because there were even parts that I remembered really liking and laughing at that I chuckled at during the rewatch. And he's probably one of my favorite parts of it. The ridiculous wig. I think every scene that they have him, the food just keeps adding to the wig. The little particles of food. (laughs) (laughs) I think I noticed that. And it's just so camp. It's so over the top. And I love him in this episode. He's probably my favorite part. So yeah. That's my favorite part, I would say, of the episode, 100%. I'll give that to you. I did like Elliot Gold in the part of the giant. Actually, I thought that was excellent casting. I remember really liking the cast, and I honestly remember hating this episode. I've never liked this episode. It's always been at the bottom of my list ever since. You don't even need to review what I wrote when I was in sixth grade. I remember I hated this episode, (laughs) and I'm not going to deny it. So that's what springs to mind. I remember this episode being boring. I remember thinking the dialogue was very cartoonish. Now that's what springs to mind. Oh, I also hated the art direction. I thought it looked kind of ridiculous. You could tell that they weren't actually on sets most of the time. I agree with that. I agree with that. Some of my opinions have softened on this rewatch. I will say that, but That was just my first impressions when I sat down to do the rewatch. But I agree with both of you. I remember Jerry Hall having a great cameo and Elliot Gould, I thought, was perfectly cast as the giant. He was eating that part up with a fork and a spoon. He loved it. So how familiar are you with the original source material, Eric? Not super familiar, to be honest with you. Yeah. Same. I don't think I ever read the original. It's one of the few original English fairy tales, I think. But I mean, like all kids, we had the picture book. But Melina, I think you brushed up on it lately. I did. So there are actually two versions of the story. The first one was Andrew Lang in 1807. And the more well-known version that this episode is based off of is the Joseph Jacobs episode from 1890. And that's the one that has kind of become more popular over time with the fee fi fo fum And so it's very true to the original story with the cow not producing milk anymore and having to take her to market, but trading her for beans instead. So it's very true to the Joseph Jacobs version. I think Andrew Lang was a Scotsman. And if I'm remembering correctly, Joseph Jacobs, I think was Australian. But yes, I seem to remember that he had, quote unquote, the definitive telling of this story. What now, Melina, you probably remember this better than me. I remember the endings being a little different, like 
as far as what happened to the giant. I could be way out on this, but I remember the endings being a little different, even from the fairy tale theater episode, Mm. just like a subplot involving Jack's father. I do not remember being in the original fairy tale. Yeah, like in the version I read, his dad is dead. His dad has passed away because they refer to his mother as the widow. So he is dead. He has passed away in this version. And then the ending of this is similar to the story that we know where he's getting chased by the giant. He climbs down, chops the tree down, the beanstalk, well, tree, the beanstalk, (laughs) and they topple over and then the giant fell down and broke his crown. (laughs) Well said. (laughs) So what do you remember thinking of the episode when you first saw it? I think I've already made my thoughts clear, Eric. (laughs) I actually remember liking this one. Okay. Hey, that's fine. Do you remember why? (laughs) I just remember I love the campiness of it. I liked, like I said, Elliot Gould. I don't know. I just, there was something about it that I really liked back then. I don't think I liked it as much this time around. (laughs) (laughs) but i mean the cast is great gene stapleton's always great i mean la gould obviously dennis christopher we haven't mentioned him yet and he's our lead yeah dennis christopher's great in it and then of course you have from watching reruns of soap back in the day oh Catherine helmand yeah Catherine helmand loved her so yeah so i mean the casting's great i mean i like the episode for that Mm -hmm. and i think that's what stood out for me to be honest with you for the episode. Melina, do you remember what you first thought of the episode back when you first saw Uh, it? I think so. Well, I think I only watched it like once or twice as a child because it wasn't one that I was a big fan of because I wasn't really a fan of the original story. And for me, the original story, whether I like it or not, kind of helps me decide if I'm going to watch something even as a child. (laughs) No, that makes sense. So yeah. And I remember thinking that Jack's mom was just like super annoying. Like I did not (laughs) like her. I just found her like, bitch, why are you crying all the time? I just, I remember just finding her really annoying. And I just, I don't know. I liked some of the giant jokes and how he's sort of this big dummy. Yeah. But other than that, not one that I like go back to. I hear that. Let's go to our recap of the episode. Now, of course, our very first shot is our introduction by Shelly. And this is a very cute introduction of her on the beanstalk. Tonight's tale is about a young dreamer named Jack, whose fertile mind sprouts ideas like a garden sprouts weeds. But one idea in particular grew to enormous proportions and reaped giant rewards. Jack and the beanstalk. Now, I actually do have a little... it, It is cute. I do have a little bit of insight on this one because... When I talked to Shelly, we discussed her different introductions, and this was the one she mentioned. She really loved how this introduction came together with her on the vine that came down. She said it was technically it was annoying, and apparently the vine she was sitting on hurt and (laughs) everything, but she thought it really came together well. And I agree with her. I really liked the introduction. I thought it was very cute how they did that. I love her outfit too. The flannel, the yellow. Oh my God, it's so cute. It was cute. But that's, I find it interesting that out of all the introductions she did, that was the one that she cited as, if not her favorite, She that was the one that just first sprung right into mind. And she's going, and that vine was uncomfortable. And they kept me hanging out yeah. forever. <laughs> So I think it was a very good introduction. We get our background music, which I think it was a French horn actually leading the melody. I do like the music in this episode upon rewatch. I was paying attention to that and I I thought it was very moody. It's a little mysterious, but kind of fun. I really enjoyed the music on that. very childlike but i i enjoyed it i might be alone in that (laughs) yeah i didn't i didn't dislike it we've definitely heard worse the composer was frank seraphine is his name just to throw that out there (laughs) yeah i i thought he did a good job believe me there's plenty of things about this episode i can criticize the music is not one of them then i think you would enjoy him emily because he actually did work on the sound in the original star trek film 
Star Trek the Motion Picture. Really? So, yeah. Actually, I could see that because that had a very long-winded score. <laughs> Emily being a Trekkie will never stop being funny to Eric. I get it. I get it. It's okay. Then we get <laughs> the art direction of a cartoon mountain. I did not like the art direction here. I just did not like it. I didn't like it as a kid. I don't like it now. It just seemed... Although, Eric, I see what you mean about camp. It is very camp, but... Like the model village? Like, I don't understand. It didn't make... Why is there a model village? I always... Even as a little kid, I was like, that's not a real town. That's a model. (laughs) It was giving me the little, like, town that he made in Beetlejuice. I was thinking the same thing. (laughs) It was ridiculous. It was just... I didn't... I never understood that. It just... It didn't make sense. It looked fake. It looked fake, but... Upon rewatch, I'm going, okay, it looked fake on purpose. That was definitely a stylized decision that they made. I don't agree with it, but it was intentional. We get our narration, which is done by the great Mark Blankfield, whom we love. We saw him when we reviewed Cinderella, and he played Edgar. Once upon a time, there was a poor widow who lived in a little cottage with her only son, Jack. We love Mark Blankfield. He was wonderful. He's our narrator. I don't love him in this episode. I much preferred him in Cinderella in that one little scene. Yeah, I love ahead. him as the narrator, though. I think he's great as the narrator. Oh, he did a great job as a narrator. I he's got a very agree. soothing voice. It's very soothing. <laughs> yeah, he's got another fairy tale theater connection. He was married for years to Brandis Kemp, who... As we all know, was Mama Bear from Goldilocks. Yeah. And later we'll get to her very famous off-screen performance as Nadine in The Three Little Pigs. That was the late, great Brandis Kemp. And Mark Blankfield and Brandis Kemp were married for years and years. So that's a good uh, fairy tale theater husband and wife duo. And he's still with us, right? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Brandis passed away during the COVID pandemic, sadly, but Mark is still with us. So... We get to the interior of Jack's house with his mother giving him an entire bean for dinner. Throwback to the first episode we ever reviewed, Aladdin, where the mother's going, I've got a bean or a fig, which would you prefer? Jack is being served an entire bean for dinner. That's what made me think. You know what that reminded me of as well? Do you remember the old like Disney fun and fancy free where they have like the little bean and Mickey (gasps) is cutting it? Yes, I wrote this in my notes. Yes. I wrote this in my notes. Yes. You are absolutely right. He's taking a bean and he's like cutting it like it's a ham. <laughs> yes. I forgot. And very like that. thin, paper thin, see through transparent pieces. Oh, I forgot <laughs> about that. Good catch. They, they definitely, they definitely <laughs> referenced that because it was the very first item of food that they ate. And they, the way she dumped it on the plate and stood there staring at it. It was definitely a reference to Mickey and the Beanstalk, 100%. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen that in so long, so thank you for catching that. We get our narrator explaining that Jack isn't of any real help around the farm. He's more of a dreamer, not a doer. I wrote in my notes, it's just strange how they shot this episode. You can tell that Dennis Christopher and Catherine Helmand were not on a set. It was a back projection. I mean, couldn't have been green screen this was the 80s but some sort of so back- cheesy it it was is a very dated looking special effect i understand why they did it later for the castle because they needed to make the giants look bigger but why did they need to do that on the farm why what why would they do that it looked bad it looked cheesy. even even when they're inside the house exactly the house looks, why you couldn't have just a it room like it a was high like a production it, well, it does. It wasn't even like an intricate house. It was a cottage. So it was like a table, a kitchen table with two chairs. So confused. I was like, why reuse the Hansel and Gretel That's cottage? Exactly I'm going Hansel and Gretel had a perfect cottage. They had a loft. They had a beautiful set. Hansel and Gretel was perfect. Just use that set. I don't understand why they did like a rear projection. And it was was so so obvious that the actors were in front of a rear projection and it it just looked bad and perspectives were all off. Oh, yeah, it was bad. Okay, not just me. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) 